Part of our ongoing discussion about data science is data science in practice. And so today, we're speaking with somebody who is going to talk about data science in healthcare, health insurance, and amazingly enough, astrophysics. I'm Michael Kriegsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Before I interview our genuinely extraordinary guest, I need you. Now, 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 subscribe on YouTube. That helps us a lot. So please subscribe on YouTube. Bulent Kiziltan is an extraordinary individual. He is the former head of deep learning at Aetna. He has also been associated with Harvard uh, doing, contributing to their data science and astrophysics uh, initiatives. And so I'm so thrilled to welcome Bulent. How are you? And thank you for being on CXO Talk. Thank you very much, Michael. It's, it's great to be here talking to you and to your audience. When it comes to uh, a healthcare company or a health insurance organization, where does data science fit in? Essentially everywhere. Eventually, it will help optimize uh, almost every vertical, not only in healthcare, uh, but in um, uh, almost every domain in the industry. And uh, healthcare uh, has been um, uh, kind of a more conservative uh, part of the industry, mainly because it's a regulated domain. So the access to data, how they use the data uh, has to be very regulated. So the uh, general infrastructure of healthcare companies, uh, especially the ones that have been around for, for quite some time, um, had to be updated in order to um, make the best out of data science. So the uh, obvious choices for using data science was to uh, not only optimize the uh, current uh, processes, operational uh, process, but also try to find new uh, uh, businesses, revenue streams that you, one can create. But more importantly, why healthcare was so attractive for me was uh, you can use data science to improve members' health. And um, improving members' health is not mutually exclusive to the business objectives of companies. And in fact, they, they are very much aligned. So um, we, use, we used to use uh, data science, analytics, uh, predictive analytics to improve members' health, uh, which uh, essentially cuts costs for them and for my company. So that, that would be the uh, part that one would start using data science. That's a very uh, intriguing and very high level statement. Data science can improve the health of members. And, and members in this case, if we're talking about a health insurance organization. And so the obvious question then, Bulent, is how? How can data science help improve members' health? That there are many, many different aspects where data science can be effectively implemented. Uh, I, I can just generalize, uh, and then we can go into detail, uh, uh, look into examples specifically. Uh, but we have to basically tune into each individual member, look at their profile, um, uh, look what geography they're living in, what their socioeconomic background is, and what is actually preventing them to be uh, healthier mem members or individuals. So the lack of exercise, uh, the lack of nutrition or malnutrition, uh, not healthy food. Uh, not exercise implemented, not taking their drugs, uh, medication regularly, not seeing the doctor on time, not getting vaccinated in time. So we can look to the whole spectrum and try to communicate uh, with a, in a customized manner to each individual member and make sure that they take steps in the right direction to get individual to, to get healthier members. So is it then ultimately a matter of communication? How does how does this this work? No, that, that's only one part of it. Uh, so, so data science uh, in, in this context and in almost every application in the industry has to be taken as a holistic perspective and lives in an ecosystem uh, where each individual part of the business process has to be effective. Unless your marketing, your communication is working really in tandem effectively with the data science team, the results that the data science team produces will not create the value that it's supposed to do. So when it comes to those individual members, we, we basically have to look in each individual member. Obviously, we come up with models and then we approximate certain aspects and we have information streaming in while we take the steps and update ourselves uh, so that we can improve the behavior 
of each individual member. So there's quite a bit of uh, uh, behavioral psychology involved as well. So for instance, uh, we look at the uh, uh, member base uh, who are uh, getting flu shots versus none. So we're trying to uh, tap into their psyche in order to understand why they are not taking the flu shot and how, what can we do to make sure that, that they, they get vaccinated, they get their flu shots and uh, encourage their neighbors to get a flu shot. So by uh, taking incremental steps, um, uh, using behavioral psychology and uh, past data that we uh, fold into our practices, we're trying to change their behavior step by step. So then is it, again, I'm trying to, to, to drill down on the multiple aspects you're describing. Mm -hmm. So you're using data science to understand members' behavior in ways that would not otherwise be possible. And yeah. then you want to give give those members feedback so that they can change their behavior based on the patterns that you've uncovered through your data science. That that's one way of uh, doing it. Specifically, yes, that's correct. And uh, so then, what are the what are the the what's the data that you would then be operating on in this use case? Yeah. Um, in, in healthcare, there are two main streams of information streaming in. One of them is from the member side, and one of them is from the provider, so provider side. So from hospitals, doctors, we have information streaming in, and we have uh, information that is coming in from the member side. In, uh, sometimes they fill out forms, um, sometimes they do certain applications. Uh, and now uh, there is a tendency, uh, a trend in, in, in healthcare is where healthcare companies are joining forces with uh, pharmacies and labs. So they are trying to tap into uh, additional information that comes from those uh, additional streams in order to see the whole spectrum, the whole journey uh, of a member that, you know, for, from the pharmacy to the doctor to the lab. So we can basically come up with models uh, that can uh, give us some insight into the psychology of that particular person. And there is also an additional uh, um, trend right now where we can uh, get some live information from wearable, uh, like Apple Watches and Fitbits and, and some, some other means, some applications, by which we can really uh, communicate uh, their latest status to our infrastructure to our recommender systems and come up with uh, better ideas how we can help the members be healthier. And I'll, I'll be happy to dive into more technical detail if you want me to. I want to remind everybody that we're speaking with Bulant Kiziltan, who is a data scientist and we're talking about healthcare and we're gonna be talking about astrophysics as well. And right now there is a tweet chat taking place and you can ask Bulant questions using the hashtag CXO talk. It's, it's really a tremendous opportunity to get your questions answered. So Bulent, you mentioned uh, technical detail. I'd love for you to dive into that a little bit, please. So um, let, let's say we want to um, work on flu in general. It's a, it's a $5 billion revenue stream for the industry. And uh, it's one of the notorious uh, use cases, mainly because for many decades, there has been um, uh, some um, uh, progress uh, in the academic world, but it has not been successfully implemented in the industry to create value. So there are multiple components to this flu problem. One of them is how can we predict when the flu season peaks at a certain geography or zip code? So that, you know, that, that is a whole uh, a different problem where you have to use past data, uh, primarily from CDC or your own, in order to predict, uh, let's say, uh, on November 2nd, what will be the outlook for flu in Boston as opposed to Miami. So that uh, I'll dive uh, deeper into this because to, to solve that problem or at least make some progress, I used my uh, astrophysics or physics background, which is which is uh, probably of interest to, to your listeners. Uh, so um, uh, initially, we want to think of how does disease spread from one individual to another? They have to interact one way or the other. This is how disease is being spread. And I was thinking of individuals as, uh, let's say, like air molecules or, or atoms in a gas. And astronomers and physicists for a very long time, many decades, have uh, come up with uh, mathematical approximations to uh, define 
the dynamical interaction of individual particles. And we use that all the time in astrophysics. We use that all the time in physics. And the mathematical base for this was actually uh, laid down in the uh, mid 1800s by mathematicians. So this is called a diffusion equation. So by using this equation and past data from the CDC, uh, which is uh, very, very useful, we can come up with models uh, how flu uh, is being spread in the continental US. And we can actually come up with models using uh, deep learning. Uh, if we see a certain case of flu in Miami, let's say late August, when do we expect a flu uh, epidemic to happen in Boston or, or if it's going to happen? So we can use that aspect to make that prediction. And that prediction plays an important role for your logistical assets, how you want to target that particular area. If you, for instance, send messages to your members two months ahead of time, uh, you know, the flu season is coming, get your flu shot, it might have an effect. But there is a sweet spot how uh, early you can reach out to your members. So you want to actually predict with certain confidence when a certain area will have a flu epidemic or case uh, that is that is relevant. So then another area is what keeps your members from getting the flu shot, right? You want to get them immune or get the flu shot, even though they're not perfect, but they're still contributing to the effort to stop the spread of flu. And th there, there's something called herd immunity. You want to have a certain percentage of your of the population to have the flu shot in order for you to stop or slow down the uh, propagation of flu. So you want to get uh, members to, to uh, have the flu shot. So then we have to look into our member base and uh, look at the cohorts um, and try to understand why they don't get the flu shot. In fact, most of the members are healthy individuals that uh, have no problem in the science with the science of the flu shot. Uh, but they don't feel the necessity to, to go to a, a store or their doctor to get the flu shot because they think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I can get the flu and it doesn't matter. So then we have to come up with ways to uh, encourage them to go and get the flu shot. And there are uh, different ways of doing that. And behavioral psychology is an important one. Also, marketing strategies is an important one. I, I can't go into the detail of the strategy itself, but in order to uh, look into the details of the cohort and try to track whether your approach is working in real time uh, is a data science uh, exercise. And what's the accuracy of the results that you achieve using data science in these kinds of examples you're describing? Yes, so, so th that really depends on the geography that you're applying to, and this is uh, still an ongoing project. We have uh, applied it in, in, in different locations in pilot areas. Uh, typically, changing the behavior of members of individuals is very, very difficult. So if you are able to change 5 or 10% of the cohort's behavior, I, th I think that can be considered a success. It adds great value, uh, but uh, it's, it's an early assessment. But I think with the approach that we have, uh, we are able to... Uh, change a more significant fraction of the cohort that will add up uh, significantly um, in terms of uh, cu cutting the cost. Now, this is a little bit more technical, but how do you decide there are different types of data science models and techniques, and how do you, how do you decide which one to apply? Yeah, so um, uh, this is a question that comes up uh, all the time. Uh, e even when you talk to the most experienced practitioners in the industry, uh, you cannot get an answer right away. They, they cannot tell you, oh, this is the problem. Uh, you can use this type of architecture. You can do, use deep learning as opposed to regular machine learning or uh, regular statistical methods, which I think are uh, undervalued in the industry. Uh, uh, stuff like uh, um, Bayesian statistics, for instance, is very useful. Uh, but then uh, what I do and what I've learned from my mentors is, you know, I directly look into the data, what type of data it is, uh, that, that, that will tell you what you can and cannot do. It's, it's the uh, ultimate determinant of your capabilities. If, if your data is no good, you know, even if you uh, use the most sophisticated method, you, you won't be able to get out something useful or of value. But then uh, you have to make sure that your data is in order, it's cleaned, and then you have to look into the data stream, whether your data is uh, homogenous, whether it comes from one or two streams, or whether it comes from different streams. And different streams of information m means uh, very different types of noise, um, uh, different types of problems, sampling uh, errors and biases. So then you have to basically step up your game in 
the sophistication or the level of sophistication that you implement or foresee uh, in, in your model. So it, it's, it's really a, a problem that you have to take step by step. And in the end, even if you see the whole picture, uh, it's very difficult to guess ahead of time which approach will perform better. So what I do typically and what, what I tell my team to do is to have uh, multiple approaches used. And you know even if you use the same approach, uh, if, if it's used by two different teams, sometimes the outcome might be slightly different. So uh, it's, it's basically a trial and error process um, uh, moving forward and looking at the met uh, me uh, metrics of success. Bulent, I know that uh, quite a number of insurance companies are using Apple Watches and Fitbits and similar devices. Yeah. And what are the what are the data science challenges and opportunities and advantages of using these devices in order to help help what actually what's the what's the goal what's the outcome of that let me ask you let me get back to basics as well right S since these are ongoing projects i will be able to talk in general terms only um, so, so those uh, um, devices like an a Apple Watch or a Fitbit is basically tracking your daily routine. And in some cases, actually, this is also open in the public, uh, there is a lot of work that goes into uh, recording your voice and based on your voice patterns, uh, making predictions about your health or your uh, uh, daily status and, and what you do in, in your psychology even, even though some limited progress has been achieved in, in that regard. But in terms of the regular uh, statistics, we know how much you move, uh, we know uh, whether uh, uh, what your heart rate profile looks like and that gives an enormous uh, detailed insight into your health. And once we combine that with other information that we have about you, about your, let's say, uh, pa past uh, uh, history about uh, uh, illnesses that you might have, your the medication that you take, it gives us very strong indications about the status of your health. I always say in AI and machine learning at large, one plus one, uh, if you do your job right, is greater than two, which means if you look at a certain stream of information, if you get something out of it, if you combine it with another stream, the um, information that you produce out of that will typically be synergistic. It will increase the value of both of them. And it, you, sometimes you can pick up information that is very sophisticate, sophisticatedly intertwined in, in what's called the higher dimensions of this information space more effectively. So you will be able to tap into different patterns. Uh, you can tap into a different source of information and you can act and execute based on that. So in this case, if we're talking again in general about insurance and using wearables, the goal is to raise awareness among the members of things that are going on with their own health, psychology and habits that they would not otherwise see so that therefore they can take action essentially and operate themselves on that data. Is that an accurate way of expressing that's, that? That's essentially the first order thing that uh, healthcare companies are trying to achieve with this, uh, especially with members where the psychological barrier is not significant. They're on the edge of making the decision and they can't, they just need an additional nudge. You have to come up with the appropriate nudge uh, at the appropriate amount so that the member either goes to the gym or takes uh, their med medication or gets the flu shot. So ultimately, I guess that's the same with it. With, I guess the goal of any data science effort is to present the information, information that the person, the human can then operate on. In this case, saying, I'm gonna get a flu shot. In, in, in that domain, yes, but, but at large, what, what makes AI so great is is the techniques that you use is transferable directly from one domain to another. Uh, so essentially what you do is you look at a data stream uh, that might come from uh, multiple streams. It might be sophisticated, it might not be sophisticated, but what you're trying to essentially do is extract information and interpret that information based on the domain expertise that you have. In the case of astrophysics, you uh, interpret and you're trying to understand the information in the context of astrophysics, in the context of healthcare, uh, you try to understand with that domain expertise and concepts. If you're in the financial sector, you're trying to do something else. But essentially the techniques 
are very similar, if not the same. So let's actually talk now about astrophysics and maybe very briefly tell us what you're doing and what you have done with astrophysics. Right. I'm uh, essentially trained uh, as an astrophysicist. Um, and uh, in that domain, what we do in many of the other fundamental sciences, as, as they do, we look at information data uh, coming from uh, different sources. Sometimes it's observational. Sometimes they are simulations. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it's a paper uh, and uh, pencil. We come up with mathematical ideas in order to uh, look for approximations. And uh, as Feynman says, science is just an approximation to the ultimate truth. So we're trying to take those steps to uh, get a better resolution on the ultimate truth in, in order to understand the universe. So um, I started as a physics major, and then I uh, worked for uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, which is uh, where the Hubble Space Telescope is uh, being operated uh, uh, from. And there, around 2000, I worked there as a data analyst, which is exactly what a data scientist is today because the term didn't exist then. So what we try to do is we try to extract information not only from what's called big data now, but also when we have very limited data or when we have corrupt data. So, so astronomers uh, have come up with really creative ways of extracting that information with uh, classical methods. Uh, then, uh, uh, during my graduate school years, I teamed up with an applied uh, uh, statistician uh, in order to implement Bayesian statistics in uh, the work that we were doing at the time. Uh, and through that, we have been able to um, extract information from very limited data. And I, I think, again, Bayesian statistics uh, in the world of data science, I think, is still undervalued. It's very powerful. And uh, once it's being uh, complemented with uh, uh, ordinary uh, machine learning methods, I think it's, it's very powerful. And we have a few uh, cases where we have extracted information more effectively. And then during uh, my time at Harvard, and then I uh, spent some time at MIT, I, I reached out to um, some of the pioneers of deep learning and worked with them. I, I was getting together, exchanging ideas, and I was introduced to the world of machine learning through them and uh, tried to implement the cutting edge know-how that mostly computer scientists and neuroscientists have produced into my own domain of astrophysics. Through that, uh, we have discovered a new type of black hole. At least we think we have uh, picked up the uh, faint signature uh, of a certain type of black hole. And through that, I branched out uh, into the industry because I saw an opportunity to make an immediate impact through the use of uh, Bayesian statistics, machine learning at large in a domain such as uh, healthcare. So now what's the connection or the relationship or the intersection between the types of techniques and data that you worked with in astrophysics and what you've done in healthcare? Because on the surface to the layman like myself, seems like you got stars, you got Apple watches, I don't see the connection. <laughs> right, so, so we, we have to go back, uh, kind of uh, dissect the whole process. The first part of the process is uh, getting the data. The second part is a cleaning and make, making sure that the data uh, is in place and is in ha at high quality. The third part of the process is to uh, extract information and all those three parts uh, are more or less, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's the same, but very similar. Domain expertise in healthcare or astrophysics is more or less not relevant in those uh, early processes, which take 70% uh, of the whole data science process, I would say. And then you have uh, the l latest stage of once you have certain insights, you need to interpret them and turn them into actionable items. Now, this is where astrophysics and healthcare obviously have nothing to do with each other, but the 70% the, the of the process is very similar. And this is why I said AI or data science is, is really great. The skill set that you build as an astronomer, as a computer scientist, is very transferable from domain to domain. And since this is a nearly emerging field, you know, we see uh, uh, a lot of data scientists in the market, but almost none of them uh, is uh, uh, formally trained in data science because 
uh, from an education perspective, we still have not settled on the proper way to train data scientists. I mean, there are lots of courses that you can take, but there's no still formal training. So people from different domains are coming into the domain of data science and bringing in their really diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse skill sets, and trying to contribute to the whole process that makes the 100%. And uh, given uh, domain experts play a crucial role, uh, business people who come from a, uh, a business perspective play an important role in the execution and creating business value. But 70, 80% of the data science process does require very little, if any, domain expertise. So when it comes to the techniques, uh, we can go into technical detail, but they are very relevant. And astronomers, uh, I have to uh, kind of advertise that particular domain, mainly because astronomers and astrophysicists are very unique in, in terms of their skill set. They use very diverse data sets. Uh, they are not limited and they have to literally think out of the box all the time. That creative aspect and talent is really, really important in extracting information in a domain that is just newly emerging. And this is why uh, astronomers uh, and astrophysicists make great, ad great data scientists, in my opinion. So at the early stages, when you're gathering the data and you're cleaning and preparing that data for analysis, the techniques are, are the same across topic domains. But then once you have that data, now you're operating on it to solve specific problems is where you need the specific domain expertise. Is that a correct way of what you, what you just said? Uh, absolutely. I think it is, it is crucially important to partner with good domain experts. And uh, also on top of that, what is also uh, sometimes missing in business operations is the uh, a complementary talent that engineers bring in, data engineers. So uh, once a, a good data science team or analytics team pairs up with domain experts and engineers, and on top of that have a, a business uh, uh, a talent on board that can execute on that, I think uh, that, that, that is the ultimate that you want to have in, in any type of operation. We have a question from Twitter, and the question is, so there are all these different uh, techniques, whether it's deep learning or cognitive computing. And so how should a business person relate to these? Where it's, They're just almost meaningless words to your average business person. Hire good data scientists and domain leaders to lead data science efforts. I think this is crucial, crucially important. Um, uh, mainly because the lack of talent, it's a newly emerging field um, individuals who have deep domain expertise in analytics or data science, in addition to a business experience, what was not there essentially because the people who had the uh, uh, domain expertise have existed outside of the industry in academia primarily, and the people who have been in the industry have been disconnected from academia where cutting edge know-how has been produced. So what we see in companies that are trying to uh, basically get into the game of data science is sometimes uh, they have uh, business people with very little domain expertise leading those efforts. And I think for the short term, that can be a remedy for the situation that they're in. But in order to have um, and create sustainable value with AI in the long term, I think it's essentially important to have domain experts with a uh, uh, business acumen to run the AI operations. And also an additional uh, 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 specific profile feature that the person has to have is uh, being an educator really helps once you're in that leadership position so that you can communicate the really complex problems to the board or stakeholders within that business. But how can a business person, I'm going back to the same question really, how can mm -hmm. a business person explain complex problems and models of data science to a very non-technical board of directors? How do you even approach that? Yeah, uh, again, being trained as an educator is important. I mean, we uh, uh, when I was in academia, uh, astronomers especially, they have an a uh, 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 significant awareness of uh, public outreach. Uh, we were uh, giving regular talks to the public and you, you have to talk in non-technical terms and really um, explain very sophisticated concepts like black hole evolution, stellar evolution, 
to uh, to the public, sometimes grade school kids. Uh, it's it's not very different in the business uh, domain, and uh, sometimes it's actually simpler. But you have to basically partner with a leader that can break things down for you and summarize things uh, to that particular business leader. And this is where finding the right leader comes into place. It's crucially important to find a person that can explain uh, complex ideas to those business people on on the uh, other side of, of, of the table, obviously, you have business people that have to educate themselves in order to uh, grasp. And there are certain uh, CEOs that uh, uh, make it mandatory to uh, almost every uh, individual uh, in their company to get uh, basic literacy in machine learning, which which will be very important. But uh, on, on my side, I think... Uh, uh, being an educator really helps in breaking down breaking down topics and uh, explaining complex ideas. You know, it's it's very interesting. Last week on this show, we had uh, the chairman of Nokia, who felt exactly as you just described that it's really important for business leaders to have a, a, a basic understanding of machine learning. And right. so he himself went back to learn about machine learning and become a programmer again after. 30 years of not doing it, so that he then taught a course that now has been taken, seen a video by many, many people, tens of thousands of people inside Nokia, which employs like a, like 100,000 wow. uh, employees. That's impressive. It's pretty amazing, but the, but the idea was exactly as you described. Business people need to have a conversant understanding at least of what machine learning is especially in the context of m what machine learning has to offer for the uh, long-term future. And I, I share uh, the vision that many of the um, uh, prominent uh, um, the members of the uh, academic setting and pioneers of the field uh, have on this. I, machine learning will play a role in every vertical, in every business where information is being stored. And that's essentially every domain. So uh, in order for uh, uh, business stakeholders and individual members to be effective and contributing members to the operations, I think it's essential that they get, get a basic literacy in machine learning. That's right. Okay. Now, you have used the term deep learning quite a bit, and that's an area of specialty for you. Right. So can you tell us what is deep learning? How is it distinct from cognitive computing or, or machine learning? Right. So um, it's, it's, it's a difficult topic. Um, and uh, the reason is uh, it's a very specialized form of machine learning. And what machine learning essentially is doing is looking at the information space and trying to dissect into pieces by using geometry, vector calculus, matrix operations and come up with approximations by which we, you can extract uh, certain patterns. And those can be called features, if you will. And that whole process is called abstraction. So machine learning essentially is a very powerful tool for abstraction. You basically look into the information landscape and trying to approximate certain type of uh, behavior or trends within that information space and come up with actionable items. And that actionable item part is called analytics. So deep learning is uh, essentially a briefly uh, a, a more effective way of abstraction. Uh, uh, but one, one of the downsides of deep learning is it's, it's very uh, data hungry. So if you are operating in a regime where your data is limited or it's not um, uh, clean enough, Sometimes you have to see whether regular or standard machine learning <clears throat> approaches uh, are more effective. Mainly, uh, you, you want to look into this mainly because deep learning is also computationally very expensive. So if you are on a timeline, you have to basically look into how much effort will go into optimizing the process and how much value in terms of information you can uh, get out of that. So. Uh, again, deep learning is just a subset, a very specialized form of machine learning, which uh, can uh, be a more effective way. And most of the time, if you have really good and a lot of data, can uh, perform much better. The abstractions, especially in an information space where information is 
interlinked in a very sophisticated manner, not, not first order or uh, uh, at low dimensionality, but it's uh, intertwined in a way which a regular machine learning cannot extract. And if you can leverage that lack of abstraction by a lot of data, deep learning will give you that edge to extract that information more effectively. What's the takeaway for business people? Because in order to make the choice between models, for example, requires a domain, the domain expertise and, of course, the understanding of the pros and cons of all of the models and how to apply them and when to apply them and what's the right type of data and the right type of situation, which your average business person is never going to learn, not in this lifetime. So what should they do? What should business people do? The business people should hire a domain expert to lead those efforts. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, I want to em emphasize, I see a lot of um, partly justified skepticism among uh, uh, business executives about the uh, uh, promise of deep learning. And uh, I think one of the um, reasons why this skepticism uh, has emerged is because there are so many people going into the field as data scientists who are not trained or sufficiently trained. Uh, sometimes they uh, overpromise uh, what deep learning can deliver, and we have to be very transparent and honest about the pros and cons of deep learning. And once you have uh, a cycle that is achieving 80% of the value with 20% of the effort, they will stick with it. You cannot convince them to use a black box uh, without a customized code and say, oh, deep learning is performing much better. You basically have to look at this in a holistic perspective. You, you have to invest into your infrastructure. You cannot use uh, 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 the old uh, uh, hardware uh, to uh, effectively use deep learning all the time. And one of the reasons why deep learning has become a, a hot topic very recently, even though the idea of deep learning has been around for more than uh, two decades now, is mainly because of the advances in the hardware and uh, the proliferation of GPUs uh, that we can purchase uh, on an individual basis. So once you look at this whole picture, uh, you have to uh, have a transparent and honest approach to deep learning and basically uh, see whether there is value in investing and uh, whether it's uh, sustainable in terms of the value that it creates with AI. So once that is in place, and also once you have the talent that you need that can really customize your architecture, your neural network architecture, but you cannot go to a black box. Uh, there are many commercial products where you just pipe in your Excel sheet and uh, uh, you cannot just claim, you know, one of the columns is now optimized and I make predictions based on deep learning. I mean, uh, th th this, is, this is not uh, deep learning in its essence, and it's, it's not what it promises in the long term. There are given lots of uh, low-hanging fruit uh, that you can pick with this uh, approach, but in order to be a leader in the field and bring in the cutting-edge know-how with deep learning and machine learning at large, I think... Uh, uh, diverse talent in the uh, data science pool is very, very important. But so many companies now, enterprise software companies, are promising that we use AI to solve, put a blank, every problem you can imagine. How can business people see through those claims in order to make decisions based on factual benefits of these products as opposed to merely the hype? Right. Uh, uh, given there is a lot of hype, and because of that hype and uh, under-delivering, that there is some uh, skepticism. Uh, but uh, one advantage of AI, uh, as we kind of uh, touched uh, on at the beginning, is uh, the 70% of the process doesn't require domain expertise. So back in the days when you want to optimize a process and create value, and optimization is just one part of it, uh, you required domain expertise from, from multiple domains in order just to complete that 70%. Right now, what you can do is you can complete that 70% and add on top of that with one or two domain experts that are uh, experts in their own field. So what that gives uh, the um, uh, companies is they can pick up the low-hanging fruit uh, with that particular quote-unquote AI. Uh, but what I've seen over and over, that optimization or that value creation could have happened with other standard methods in the past, 
either uh, the reason why it didn't happen is either uh, they didn't invest into it or they didn't have the talent in those multiple domains. Now, AI is providing them uh, with the means of uh, coming up with a better, more optimized uh, business uh, processes with data scientists plus a domain expert. So, but, but as I said, I don't think that this type of approach will be sustainable in the long term because of uh, the archaic uh, methods uh, that was used or the lack of talent uh, in, in business operations. Um, there was a lot of inertia in, in uh, mid-sized and bigger companies in the past startups. They operate in a totally different uh, culture. So that's a different type of uh, uh, topic that we can discuss. But mid-sized and larger companies, uh, they create silos and uh, to break those silos and make those different uh, verticals talk to each other in an effective manner created some of the problems in the past. And with AI, you can overcome that easily. But I, I say again, uh, this is not the AI uh, for the future. This is just uh, picking up the low hanging fruit. And if you build your strategy based on what you can achieve today, you will fail tomorrow. Okay, we have about three minutes left. And so let's let's finish off. I know you've been giving a lot of advice to business people, but amplify any of the points that you've made that you think are most important for business people to understand in their approach to dealing with AI, machine learning, and so forth. What I would say is stay away from generic solutions. Uh, solutions, strategies have to be customized to your particular company, to the budget you have, to the business objectives you might have, the timeline you have, the business, uh, the uh, uh, technical skills you have on board. Uh, so you, you cannot just, uh, you know, uh, pick up a, a YouTube or a, a consultant and uh, ask them to deliver you a strategy that they have delivered to another company. So things have to be customized when you're building your strategy. And while you build that strategy, again, a finding as rare as it may be, a finding that domain expert with some business background and experience is crucially important to scale your strategy for the future if you want to. Uh, sustain the value that AI creates. And also, uh, data science analytics is a very interdisciplinary um, um, process. So uh, I would encourage companies to diversify uh, their uh, talent pool um, and also uh, keep on training your data scientists. If you hire a data scientist uh, and then you uh, overwork them 100%, if you don't give them creative space and if you don't train them, they will become obsolete in six months, essentially, because things are changing uh, on a weekly basis. So I think uh, uh, keeping up with uh, uh, what's happening, uh, being a constant learner and a student is also essential for that particular analytics team. Okay. Wow. This has been a very action-packed 45 minutes and a really fast. Uh, Bulent Kaziltan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Wonderful to talk to you. And I hope you'll come back and do this again another time as well. Anytime. Everybody, you've been watching CXO Talk. It's been a great conversation about data science. Now is the time. Subscribe on YouTube. That helps us out a lot. Go to cxotalk.com. We have a huge number of videos, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.